All righty. Thank you, Andrew. Let me just show my screen. And one second. My screen. And we will begin the presentation. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Regina Fitzpatrick. I'm the genealogy librarian here at the State Library. Um, many of you who know me or have attended my classes know that in addition to my time at, at the State Library, which has been a uh, little over two and a half years now, I also worked at the uh, New Jersey State Archives for many years. Uh, so I've had over 10 years of experience uh, doing New Jersey genealogy. And over the years, I've just uncovered some really neat stories. Now, usually when I do classes, I'm presenting to you informational in stuff about, you know, how you do your genealogy, et cetera, et cetera, and so on. Uh, but I think it's fun every once in a while to do something like this, where we just talk about, you know, some neat things that have been uncovered in the course of research. Uh, we take some time to turn, you know, these, these written names and the historical record into people with fleshed out stories. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to sharing uh, these stories with you. I think that this will probably be a little bit of a shorter program because I'll only be presenting three uh, stories. And uh, so what I'm going to do is at the end of every story, I'm going to pause and see if you have any questions about the information I've presented. If you have unrelated genealogy questions uh, that are not about the specific story, I will take some time at the end to answer just general genealogy questions, and then uh, you can also email those to me. So uh, like I said, I will pause, and if you have any questions about the particular story, like if you feel like you missed a detail or something, or you want some clarification, um, just let me know. Also, since we're telling stories here, you know, I'm not putting a lot of citations in here. So what I'm going to do at the end of the presentation, I will be posting a blog post on the State Library's website. Um, and Andrew will provide the link to that at the end of the program. And it will have citations to all of the documents that I've referenced and where you can find them in case you want to look at the original documents and see how I put these stories together yourself. So without further ado, let's dive into our first story. Now you will see here this very elaborate looking uh, gravestone uh, and it belongs to James Harris Jr. It's located in the old Presbyterian graveyard in Brown Bound Brook. Um, and I took this image uh, from find a grave of, of the grave. And um, there, in addition to this particular stone, uh, it's very beautifully and elaborately carved, as you can see, there are also stones for other family members, um, James's parents, Anne and James Harris Sr., and also for James's brother, David. Uh, from James Stone, we know when he died and his exact age. And uh, we know that he was born on June 23rd, 1755. The patron who contacted me was actually uh, a librarian who was working on a history of the cemetery, like a little history pamphlet. And based on the ages of James and David, she wanted to know if either of them had served in the Revolutionary War. And she thought it would be really interesting uh, to see if they have Revolutionary War service records so she could talk a little bit more about, you know, the people who were buried in these, in these plots. So I did my usual military checks when I look for uh, Revolutionary War soldiers. I went into strikers, 
um, and I checked to see if they had pensions. And I was able to find a David Harris. Since that's a pretty common name, I wasn't sure it was, you know, the particular man of interest in this case. But I wasn't able to find anything for James Harris Jr. Um, so I moved on to other colonial resources. And I do this when I can't find somebody in the military record to make sure that uh, the person is searching for their ancestor in the right place because they could have been told that the person was living in one county and maybe they lived in another. So I checked uh, the wills, uh, the colonial marriage bonds, which is a collection we'll be talking about throughout these stories, the early land records, deeds often help establish where somebody lived if they owned land, or Supreme Court case files. Most of these are databases on the State Archives website. These are primary documents um, that the State Archives has, but we have many of the indexes here, so we can definitely point people in the correct direction. So imagine my shock when I find this. As you can see on the very left of the screen, there is a James Harris Jr. in the Supreme Court case filed. Um, and he's listed as a co-defendant in a criminal case. Uh, and he's indicted for murder in Middlesex County in 1770. And I said, whoa, really? And I wondered if this could be the correct James Harris Jr. linked to the to this same gravestone. Uh, at the time, this is the, the, the screenshot on the left is an updated uh, screenshot of the uh, Supreme Court case files indexes. At the time, it was very basic and did not have all of this information. It just said his name and that he was indicted for murder. Once we found this case file, um, we were able, uh, the the woman who is in charge of this particular collection was able to go in and abstract and provide a little bit more detail. But at any rate, you can see how I was able to verify that this was the correct person was looking at the middle document, which is from uh, extracts from Colonial Newspapers, which is a published series. Uh, and I was able to just go into the index and look up James Harris Jr. and find this news article that describes exactly what happened in this case. So you can see on January 9th, um, William Daniels was beaten, stripped naked and beaten and um, they can't locate one of the co-defendants and it has a very detailed description of him. Uh, but you can see that the person who is paying the reward is James Harris Sr., who is presumably the father of James Harris Jr. Um, so this is, this is very interesting and it ties back to the elaborate headstone because you can see that this is a very wealthy family. So the other co-defendant, which is Daniel Buskirk, is not mentioned in this particular article. And then we can see on the left in the colonial marriage bonds that James Harris Sr. marries Anne Van Buskirk. And we know that this matches James Harris Jr.'s mother's name. So I'm guessing that the other Daniel is probably James Harris Sr.'s nephew and James Harris Jr.'s cousin. So this is all very interesting. So these two of the men involved in this assault on William Daniels uh, were cousins and they belong to a wealthy and influential family. So we are slowly building a larger picture of what is going on here. Now, when you go into Supreme Court case files, uh, sometimes you get very little information and sometimes you get a whole lot of information. And in this case, we were incredibly lucky. We got a whole lot of information on this particular case. 
So Daniel Buskirk, uh, who's the cousin of James Harris Jr., uh, was was uh, deposed at length. And you can see uh, his deposition is on the left-hand side of the screen. And then on the verso side of this page that I've captured here is a brief testimony of James Harris Jr. So let's hear what happened, how, how William Daniels was murdered. So here is a brief summary of what happened. On the evening of January 9th, 1770, a woman named Sarah Daniels turned up at the Harris house claiming that her husband, William Daniels, had beaten her. Harris, James Harris, Daniel Buskirk, and Daniel Howell, who was mentioned in the newspaper article as being at large and being sought uh, with a reward uh, that uh, James Harris Sr. is going to pay, apparently took it upon themselves to take retribution on her behalf. They disguised themselves in women's clothing and blackened their faces. They took several whips made of birch and hickory and went to the Daniels house where they found Mr. Daniels, dragged him outside, stripped him and beat him with the whips. When Mr. Daniels asked why he was being beaten, they told him that it was in retribution for beating his wife. Once finished, they told him to get up and go inside. And then they went back to the Harris home and reported to Sarah Daniels that they had beaten her husband. Her reaction is not recorded. They found out, so the next day they found out that, that William Daniels died. Buskirk and Harris fled to Sussex County on horseback once they found out about the death of William Daniels, but returned three days later on January 12th to face the music. In his testimony, which is the upper right screenshot, uh, James Harris Jr. agreed with his cousin and only added that he and Mr. Howell buried the tips of their whips in the ashes before they left the house so that they would not snap. And finally, on an interesting and possibly unrelated note, um, Daniel Howell, who is still at large, only uh, the two cousins are back to face the music for this particular crime. Daniel Howell uh, was separately indicted for a different assault against a John Giles, which also took place on January 9th, 1770. So the guy who's at large committed two assaults in one day. The Supreme Court case files have documents that are related to the case itself, which means oftentimes within the Supreme Court case files, uh, you don't get to find out what happened in the case. Fortunately, it, uh, over at the State Archives, we also have the Supreme Court judgment books, which, you know, may record rendered verdicts, things of that nature. And so that's what we have here. We know the outcome of this case, which is, um, which is fantastic. So on the upper left uh, screenshot, we see uh that daniel howell daniel buskirk and james harris jr are being indicted for this murder and then the second screenshot the large one uh, the the one on the upper left we see that mr howell is at large so only daniel buskirk and james harris are listed in the indictment for murder and this you know sets out when they're supposed to appear etc 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 and you can see that this is in april of 1770 and then at the bottom we see the sentence passed against them so Do, 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 do. I'm sorry, I'm reading my notes here, so I don't leave anything out. So 
Buskirk and Harris were tried together and were judged not guilty of murder, but convicted of manslaughter in September of 1770. So it took about nine months to convict them. Their punishment was branding on the hand a 200 pound fine each plus a hundred pound surety, uh, which is a bond for good behavior each. Presumably since uh, James Harris Sr. is fairly wealthy, um, you know, they, they were able to get decent attorneys and um, had their sureties and fines easily paid. So I would assume that they spent no time in jail. Um, however, they would have a permanent mark of this adventure on their hand. So remember in the beginning, we looked at James Harris Jr.'s gravestone and we knew exactly how old he was and when he died. So how old was he when all of this happened? He was 14 years old when he murdered this guy. So I would assume, although I, I have no information on Daniel Buskirk, I have not been able to find him in the records, I'm very curious about him and to learn more about him, um, that Daniel Buskirk was of a similar age. Um, I found no information on Daniel Howell, the third defendant in this case, who was never caught. Uh, he does not appear again in the minute books for these cases. So it's it's very interesting. He may have fled New Jersey. We, we just don't know. Uh, and I also wasn't able to find anything about William or Sarah Daniels. Um, I am not sure why Sarah Daniels felt it necessary to go to the Harris house after she was beaten by her husband. Was she also a relative? Uh, did she have some kind of uh, connection to Mr. Howell? We, we just don't know the answer to these uh, questions and they're going to re be remained unanswered for now. So all of the characters in this story are not fully fleshed out, but we do have additional information about James Harris Jr. So what we can see on the upper uh, left screenshot is the will of James Harris Sr. who died in May of 17, well, he didn't die, but his estate was probated in May of 1792. Uh, you can see that he leaves his eldest son, James Jr., 50 pounds to be paid by his son, David, in four equal payments. So he, this kind of adds to the assumption that he was quite wealthy. He owned land, uh, he owned a plantation, and he could leave legacy to his wife and uh, children and pay his debts. So I'm sure at the time of uh, his son's murder trial, this was a huge help to him. So we see that he did leave his eldest son some money and then when his son dies a few decades later, about a decade, uh, no, about two decades later, um, he died with property, children, he was married, he was able to give legacies out, um, and he apparently had a very good life. We can also see that he was a slave owner. He owned at least two slaves. Um, so I would guess that the incident that happened when he was 14 years old did not damage him all of that much. And um, he, he was able to live a, a good life and, uh, and pass along a lot of um, legacies to his family, including building uh, the gravestones for himself and uh, his parents, which is mentioned in the little abstract there. And you can see that in the full text of his will, which is available over at the archives. So that is our first story of James Harris Jr. Does anybody have any questions about this case? Anything that I can clarify, add to?
All right. If anybody has uh, any questions going forward or you think of something as we're going through other stories, feel free to ask me at the end. And then, like I said, I will have a blog post with all of the citations and links to all of the documents where you can read for yourself about James Harris Jr. Uh, and you can see what you think and if there's anything to add. Uh, Regina, we just had a question come in and it has to do with uh, the court case information. Yeah. Um, Marcy asks, I have a document in which David Flynn had a case of trespass brought against him in Middlesex County in 1763. Where would I find information about the court case and the outcome? You would need to go over to the archives. They have all of the Supreme Court case files. Um, and as I said, you can uh, look if it's a Supreme Court case file, depending on the county too, they will have, there will be some uh, county level uh, cases as well. And uh, you can go there and there will be some county, county court of common pleas judgment books, just like the Supreme Court judgment books and minute books. So that may help you flesh out the information in the case files as we can see that it did in James Harris Jr.'s case, because as I said, within the New Jersey case files, with the, within the Supreme Court case files, um, often, you know, it's papers and documents related to the case, but it doesn't give you a complete narrative of the case, and oftentimes you don't get an outcome to the case. So there are a few things you can do if you want more information. Um, unfortunately, since we're talking about, you know, the colonial and early federal era, not everything was recorded. So those, those are the best places to start, but also don't be surprised if you can't find anything either. Sometimes you get very lucky and sometimes you don't. Any additional questions, Andrew? Um, Jeffrey asks, Supreme Court office obviously has a different definition in our colonial years as it does now, um, or did all court matters get handled by the state? No, there was a, a hierarchy of courts. So court cases would not start out, um, you know, just going to the Supreme Court. Uh, they would start out as common pleas cases in the county uh, and then for money matters, uh, especially dealing with estates, there was uh, the chancery court as well. So they would start out in those places and then, you know, if, if there was a question about the judgment, et cetera, et cetera, it would then go to the uh, Supreme Court. Vivian Thiel, uh, the archivist who's in charge of court records over at the State Archives, um, can give you a, a really great summary of the court structure in colonial era New Jersey, um, which is really fascinating and interesting. If you're ever doing court research over there uh, and you're dealing in the colonial Ira, Vivian is a really great resource, and uh, if she's available, I would strongly suggest talking to her. All right, I think that's it for questions. So you're all set. Okay, excellent. So we are going to move on to uh, our next story, and you know, since we are, we live in a culture where. Uh, we move from one holiday to the next, no matter how far apart they are and how far off the next holiday may be. And considering on January 2nd, they were stocking the grocery stores and convenience stores with Valentine's Day cards and candy and all that good stuff. This is a very appropriate story. Uh, this is our, our token love story. I always like to put in a nice little love story into my genealogical research story. And it involves a man named Frederick Denelsbeck. 
Um, now, like our previous story, this involves a Frederick Sr. and a Frederick Jr. Uh, the Frederick we will be discussing is Jr., although uh, we will be discussing his father. Uh, this was a will request that we got uh, several years ago when I worked over at the state archives. Um, and as you can see on the lower uh, right of the screen, you can see how kind of difficult the handwriting is uh, to read there. So what we always do to help people is there is a, uh, a book series that abstracts uh, the will collection. So we'll always print a copy of this uh, to go with the will in case, uh, you know, the the cursive is not legible to the person receiving it. And so I read this little extract, which is on the upper left, and I was fascinated. So apparently, uh, Frederick Denelsbeck Sr. left provisions uh, wherein his son is given a legacy outright. However, there is a condition to his son's Frederick's uh, leg legacy. So it says, should my son Frederick marry a woman that has no Dutch blood or part Dutch, he shall have only five shillings. Otherwise, he gives him his homestead plantation and a full legacy. Uh, you can see that the land holding that he would get uh, is quite significant. Uh, and you can see that uh, Mr. Denelsbeck's uh, will was probated on uh, December 9th, 1776, and that will be significant later. Now, by Dutch, Denelsbeck does not sound like a very Dutch name. So I'm assuming here that they mean Deutsch as in German. Uh, and this is a German family that we are dealing with. And uh, Frederick Sr. seems to have some very strong ideas about who um, his son should marry exactly. And the fact that there is a specific provision uh, that he wants his son Frederick to marry somebody of a particular heritage. I wondered if Frederick may have had a girlfriend who uh, was not German. And look at this. So on the left, we have the index to the colonial marriage bonds. Uh, and we can see that a Frederick Denelsbeck of Salem County took out a colonial marriage bond to marry a woman named Barbara Elwell, and that the date of the bond is the same date that his father's will was uh, proven. And interestingly, on the right, we see the colonial marriage bond in full. Now, uh, colonial marriage bonds are very boilerplate documents. They are not a marriage record themselves. They are a document of intent. And if somebody signed one of these, they almost certainly married uh, because it involved a hefty amount of money. They were required to pay a $500 bond uh, to the government. So the people who signed these things were dead serious about getting married, even though this is not the exact marriage date. So Frederick, the second his father's will was read, went out, got this marriage bond, and you can see that his brother, John, who stood to inherit Frederick's legacy if he didn't step up and play ball, is the co-signer on this, which is really interesting and shows a lot of, you know, not only romantic love, but brotherly love as well. Uh, so apparently John Denelsbeck stood by his brother, made sure that he got his legacy, and also supported him in his marriage to somebody who was uh, presumably of English heritage based on her last name, Elwell. Um, so this, this is very, very interesting case and, you know, fills the, 
the cockles of my heart and makes me happy. Um, I did try to do some research on this particular couple, on Frederick and Barbara, uh, to see if I could find an exact wedding date when they got married. Um, I could not, unfortunately. Uh, but we see that they've got, uh, I was able to look on family search and find death records for them. And they stayed married. And uh, so they presumably had a, a happy life together and uh, rode off into the sunset with the help of um, Frederick's brother, John. And, uh, and this brings our story to a very happy ending. Does anybody have any questions about this particular story? Um, nothing I see, but Vicky raised her hand. Um, Vicky, if you could type a question, let's see if this came through. Ah, here we go. Okay, we have one. Was a marriage bond necessary? No, it was not. Many, uh, the marriage bonds were originated basically to protect a bride's dowry. So only wealthy couples were going to get these out. Or if one party was extremely wealthy, presumably the bride, because it was meant uh, to protect her. And it was a, a legally binding document, which is why I said, like, people did not sign these things to not get married. So I would presume that... Um, you know, Barbara Elwell's family was pretty well healed at all, although I have not been able to turn up anything on her other than, you know, her part in this story marrying Frederick Jr. All right, we have another question from Elise. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, have the property records been checked to see if Frederick got a part of his father's property? I did some research into this and I was not able to find any land records, but that doesn't mean uh, anything from the 1760s. Uh, late 1700s is kind of a transitional um, time period. And sometimes you'll find a gap between the colonial period and, um, and the early federal period when you start seeing uh, deeds recorded at the county level. And this is also because uh, in New Jersey, there was land corruption dating from the 17th century. Uh, if anybody is familiar with the Elizabethtown Bill in Chancery, which was published in 1743, basically there was so much fighting over land because there were duplicate deeds selling the same land to different people because it was so unclear about who owned what. There were confusions, there were land riots throughout the years. Um, so a lot of this resulted because things weren't recorded or because people sold the same property multiple times, which was, of course, illegal. But of course, this happened, you know, long before the contemporary period. And by contemporary, I mean their contemporary, not our contemporary. So it was just a massive, confusing mess during this time period. So it's not surprising that there are some land records uh, missing or not recorded. Um, I believe, because I haven't looked at this case in a long time, I did try to go into um, Gloucester and Salem County and see if I could find either of the bro brothers. And from my, what I remember, I didn't have very much luck. But I would guess since Frederick paid, um, since Frederick took out the bond the same day that his father's will was proved, 
that he just said, well, okay, I'm not married. I'm, I'm not attached to anybody right now. And he, he snagged up his inheritance. And then he and his brother, John, because John was apparently okay with it, went and they took out the bond. And so he got to have his cake and eat it too. Of course, I don't know that because I don't have the records to prove it, but that's what I'm guessing. All right. And Jean asked, which I think you just answered, uh, that once the will was probated, was the reduction to five shilling mute? Yeah, I, I think that he that he, you know, went to uh, to the reading of the will first and said, well, I'm not married. And then he took out the bond. All right. That seems to be it. OK, excellent. So uh, we have one last story, um, and this is a really cool story. This is one of my genealogy success stories. I love this. Um, and this is the story of a former slave uh, named Clara Madden. Uh, she was enslaved in Baltimore. Um, she ended up, and this is all background uh, that was told to me by her ancestor who was trying to find out more information on her. She had a significant information on her children uh, and, and later relatives. And uh, one of her aunts, one of the children of Claire Madden, uh, was able to tell this woman, you know, the family oral history, which was basically that Claire Madden fell in love with the son of her owner, became his mistress, had several children with him. And once um, after the Civil War, she ended up living with him for a while as his mistress in Baltimore. And then he died and the family was left on their own. And so she was trying to figure out because at some point the family moved to New Jersey in the late 1800s, or at least part of the family did. And Clara was allegedly there and she could not find her death and was looking for her grave because she was putting together information for a family reunion. So she asked me if I could help her. Normally, I will not do elaborate genealogical research like this for an individual, um, but I usually make exceptions for former slaves because they are very, very difficult to find. Um, and I, I like to help as much as I can because uh, of the advanced genealogical skill you sometimes need to locate these people if you are lucky enough to locate them. So this story does have a happy ending. I was able to find uh, the death record for Clara and where she was buried. Uh, so this made this lady very, very happy. So here is what uh, she had. So when she came to me, she was able to find uh, Clara Madden living in 1900 in Jersey City, New Jersey. So she was thinking that she died around 1900, maybe a little bit after, uh, because she couldn't find her on any further census records. And she wanted to know if it's possible that even though the family was from Baltimore, and a large portion of the family had remained in Baltimore, uh, if she could have died here in New Jersey. So you can see that uh, 1870, 1880, and 1900, and this research was done too before the 1885 state census. All of these state censuses were available on Ancestry, so I don't have screenshots of that. Um, but, and I couldn't find her in the 1895 census, so she was probably not in New Jersey at that point. Uh, but she's there in 1915, and you can see that she's in the Hudson County Hospital for the insane. So I was able to find her in 1915. That's the latest I was able to find her. So 
here is the kind of research I will do uh, for a former slave. Now this goes in chronological order moving forward, but I always start backwards. So I started with the 1915 census and worked my way back looking for her and her children throughout uh, the census and recording all of the information. I do this so that if I can't find Clara, I can look at her kids and see if she's living uh, with any of her kids at uh, any point in, in the censuses. So this is the type of research I will do when I am searching for um, a former slave, because often too, the information is inconsistent. Um, and what I usually find when I'm doing slave research is you look for patterns and you see if there's any consistency and you, based on your best bet guess, the most consistent information is usually what I take to be true. Um, but, you know, that, that kind of varies and it's, it's not always the case. But going back, we know that Claire Madden is on the 1915 census and she is institutionalized uh, in the Hudson County Hospital for the insane. Her age does not match with what she know based, what we know based on her age listed with other censuses, but I guessed that it could possibly be her, and that gave me some hope because since this woman was institutionalized and it's in the 20th century, it's very likely she's going to have a death record because the institution has procedures, they're linked to the state, they're going to follow proper procedure and file a death record. And luckily, uh, death records at this time uh, are listed in alphabetical order within the calendar year by the person's last name. So I checked 1915 and 1916 and I was able to find uh, Clara Madden's death record in 1960. She's buried in Asbury Park, Monmouth County. Um, she's 80 years old. She's suffering from senile dementia. It lists uh, her father and uh, the informant on her death record is her daughter, Emma, who we see her on the census with. Now, interestingly, I did do some city directory work here to see if I could find Clara, but since she was always living with her daughter, Emma, Emma was listed as the head of household in the city directory and Clara was not listed at all, unfortunately. Um, So what I did just as a reality check, just to make sure that this was the correct uh, Clara Madden and with Emma Rayner, I was like pretty much 100% sure that it was, but I did check the 1920 census just to make sure there wasn't another Clara Madden listed anywhere. Uh, I was able to find Emma and Emma's daughter, Alice Itson and her husband. Um, so this was definitely the correct person, even though on the 1915 census, her age is wildly incorrect. Um, now, what we were not sure about uh, was Asbury Park, whether or not they meant uh, the town in Monmouth County, because as you can see, Alice Itson, Clara's granddaughter, lives in Neptune in Monmouth County. Um, so they may not have named the cemetery or Asbury Park could have been a cemetery name. We are not sure. Um, the lady followed up because she was still searching definitively for the cemetery. And we did some research on uh, the funeral director and parlor 
where uh, who handled ha handled Clara's burial um, to try to see if we could find out a little bit more information and see if they had any ties specifically to Asbury Park, which has an excellent historical society. But unfortunately, uh, they were based out of Jersey City and there was no further information um, where we could confirm that she was actually buried. So as far as I know, the lady uh, who sent me this request is still working and she's working with a professional genealogist now to see if they can find more information and more records of this particular funeral parlor that handled her burial and uh, trying to definitively identify the cemetery where she is buried. Uh, so I, I basically told this lady, please, when you find something, call me because I, I need to know like how, how this ends. So I'm, I'm very curious and very hopeful that uh, she's able to find this because as I said, former slaves are very difficult and you're very lucky when you get a case like this where you find so much information and are able to, you know, get an actual record that tells you kind of what happened to them. So that is the end of Clara Madden's story. Does anybody have any questions about Clara? No takers, Andrew? Uh, not yet. Uh, Muriel has raised her hand. Okay. Um, so if you could submit a question via the question box or the chat, um, that would be great. Let's see. And then after this, if nobody has any questions about Clara, I'll open the floor to general genealogical questions. But I just want to see quickly if anybody, you know, has any specific questions about this story. Um, let me see. I mean, we, we can open the floor up to general questions as well now, too. Okay. Oh, and I forgot to show you Clara's, um, uh, uh, her death record. I'm sorry. So this is, this is her death record. And as you can see in the uh, lower right-hand corner, uh, it says place of burial or removal, and it says Asbury Park, and it gives you the undertaker's name and uh, the address of the funeral home. So this is how I was able to uh, research it. And this is document where we were able to pull all of the information from. So I apologize. I completely forgot I had that slide in there. But yes, I, I welcome any general genealogical uh, questions at this point. And then too, if you have some cool stories, uh, please feel free to email me with them because I love hearing cool genealogy stories. Um, Marcy has a question and it's, I intend to make my first visit to the State Library and the archives in the fall. What can I do prior to my visit to prep and make the most out of it? I've never been and want to be as prepared as possible. Uh, it depends on what time period you're researching, Marcy. If you are researching the post-May of 1848 era, okay, when there are vital records in existence, that's birth, marriage, and death records, I would highly recommend concentrating your research on the state archives. The reason that I say this is that, as we can see from that shot of Claire Madden's death record, 
those vital records are going to provide you with a lot of biographical information on your ancestors, uh, and they're going to be the most authoritative search. So if you are working in the post-May of 1848 era, uh, and your your research is taking you up through the 20th century uh, to 1923 for births, uh, 1948 for marriages, and 1955 for deaths, uh, I would start your research over at the state archives. Uh, in addition to the vital records, they also have wills going up to 1952, tons of county land records, um, and other records uh, going up. Usually the, the records for the counties are on microfilm until 1900 or 1910, but the indexes go up uh, usually through the mid 20th century. I think there are a few counties where you can get them up through the 1970s. Um, so that's all really useful information for land. So that will take you as far as wills and land records, that will take you from the colonial era uh, to the 20th century. So that's really useful. Now, if you're researching uh, pre-May of 1848, we over here at the State Library have tons of family histories. Um, and ahead of your visit, you can go on the library's catalog and you can do a subject keyword search and you can search, uh, say, the Jones family. And that will pull up all of our family histories for you that mention the surname Jones. So that might be something useful you can do ahead of time for state library research. In addition, uh, for everybody, uh, we have a pretty extensive city directories collection here at the state library. We have about a thousand New Jersey city directories, and those usually date uh, from the, the mid 1800s up through the 1900s. Um, and we have our city directory catalog online uh, where you can look that up. If you visit the archives, the state archives website, uh, they have databases and indexes for many of their collections. So that's also a great step to take before you go and research over at the archives. You can also order from there some of their collections uh, remotely. Uh, so that's that's something nice. Now, I know you're not going to remember all of this because I just spit that all out. So all of this information is up on the genealogy research guide. Uh, and I will make sure that you have a link to that in the blog post. But if you go uh, on the State Library's website, you go to Research Library, there's a link to research guides, and it lists all of our subject research guides alphabetically. Look for genealogy, click on that. And I have links to the city directory catalog. You can search the catalog from there. I have information on all of the uh, archives most popular collections. I have uh, worksheets and handouts about New Jersey genealogy and about you know how to get started and do genealogy in general. So there's a lot of good information on that site. I just posted a link to the genealogy guide in the chat for everybody. Oh, thank you, Andrew. Um, and Marcy said that she'll be doing 1760 and prior, so I don't know if there's anything extra you wanted to add. Well, uh, colonial research, you can still do lots of research over at the archives. We've got the early land records um, and the wills, the colonial marriage bonds, which we all saw in this presentation. Uh, they have a very similar New Jersey book collection to us. So they have the published extracts from New Jersey newspapers, which we saw here. They've got the Supreme Court case files. So if you're looking for records, uh, go over to the archives. If you're kind of striking out there and you're not having much luck in that time period, come over here and see if we have anything in the family histories. Um, or if anybody uh, kind of left New Jersey, we have books, not only for New Jersey, but uh, the rest of the country in some more than others, uh, and also information on doing general genealogical work and uh, some information on uh, foreign countries and ethnic groups who came into the United States at various times. So that may be helpful to you in your research as well. 
All right, Linda has a question. Uh, with non-cemetery burial listed, did they still have to file the debt with the death with the county? I have several in Sussex County and cannot find death record. They find a grave, the fi find a grave list as non-cemetery burial. Okay. Um, what time period are we talking about? Is this pre-May of 1848 or post? Uh, I'm not sure, so we'll wait for a follow-up. Yeah, if it's if it's pre-May of 1848, they could do whatever they want because the state was not recording vital records at the time, and that includes death records. Post May of 1848, they would file death records with the state when they started out. So between May of 1848 and May of 1878, it's estimated that approximately 60 percent of events were never recorded. This is because people were still adjusting to the new law and you know they didn't always uh, you know fo follow proper procedure. All deaths were reported to the state. They were never reported to the county. The counties collected marriage returns from various ministers and that started you know in the in the late 1700s but deaths were never recorded by the county and were never cataloged. Now, in May of 1848, when they started um, collecting death records at the state level, those deaths were also filed at the municipal level. So every municipality other than Jersey City, New Jersey, has a, uh, has a municipal registrar who collects vital records as well. Um, so if you can't find it at the state level, you can try it at the municipal level, but probably the records are identical. So there's a good chance it won't be at the municipal level. All right, uh, Charles wanted to point out that your email address is misspelled, Regina. Is it? Oh, it is, thank you. <laughs> I did not notice that. My last name is F-I-T-Z-P-A-T-R-I-C-K. Um, and the links are correct. I will update the presentation. Thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> All right. Uh, Chris wanted to share some information. Um, says, anyone interested in the law and courts as they relate to genealogy, especially in New Jersey, I would recommend checking out Judy Russell, the legal genealogist. Great blog and talk, seen her quite a few times. Yeah, great. So, let's see. I don't see any more questions, so. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. And and like I said, you know, if you have more in-depth genealogy questions, please feel free to follow up and email me. I'm happy, you know, to work with you via email. And also, too, if you have any cool research stories that you want to share, please feel free to pass them along. I love hearing about, you know, neat things that you've uncovered in your research. Uh uh, Janine has a question. Do we need a username and password to access any of these records and can we do them remotely or do we need to go to the library to use them? Um, I know Janine, she's a state employee. So the records that I discussed within uh, the presentation, uh, some of them like the census records, you can get on Ancestry. So that means you need to come here or go to your local public library because uh, remote access, remote licensing for Ancestry is extremely expensive. So many libraries have an in-house uh, use only policy. Uh, we have a Ancestry subscription here. You can come to the library and use our computers. Uh, the archives also has an Ancestry uh, subscription, you can go there. So they'll have things like the census records and indexes to some of the New Jersey vital records and some other things. The records themselves are not going to be online. They're going to be at the archives. You're going to have to go there 
and physically look at them. As I said, what you can do, uh, the archives has uh, indexes, order forms uh, on their website. So some of these collections, like the colonial marriage bonds, um, some of the military records, uh, the land deeds, the Supreme Court case files, uh, the vital records, uh, which and the vital records indexing projects are not yet finished. I, I must add that caveat. Uh, but they have indexes of what they have on the State Archives website, and you can order records remotely from right there and pay with a credit card if you find something. For collections that are not indexed, you'll need to go and look at the collections themselves. Now, things like uh, the New Jersey Wills up to 1900s, they have published booked indexes that were published before copyright law. So Ancestry has those digitized. Uh, so do websites like Hathi Trust, archive.org, Google Books. You can look up the indexes to New Jersey Wills online. And you can check those before you go to the archive. So you can check and see if somebody had a published will before 1900. And then you can go on the archives website and you can order it that way. But it varies from collection to collection. But no, all of the records collections I discussed today, other than the census, you got to go to the archives and get them. Uh, Pat asks, how long were marriage bonds used? Marriage bonds were 17th and 18th century. There may have been a few up to 1800, maybe a few after, but they fell out of vogue after that. I'm not sure why. I'm not sure if there was a legal change. Um, you can read about the collection on, um, on the database index page, and that may have information about why exactly they stopped using the marriage bonds. And it may have just beca been because once New Jersey became a state, they eventually just changed the law. But honestly, I am not sure why they stopped with the marriage bonds. I don't see any more questions, so. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for attending today. Um, everybody sh will be getting a follow-up email, um, which I will include a link to this webinar that you can view at any time, as long as links to uh, the blog post as well as the genealogy research guide. So if there's anything you missed, you want to go back, you'll have plenty of resources in order to do that. So. All right. Well, I hope everybody enjoys their day and thank you for attending. Thank you, everyone.